And joining us from Boston is attorney Lisa Thoreau. She is the former managing director of the Juvenile Justice Center of Suffolk Law School and the founder of a nonprofit organization called Strategies for Youth. First question to you, Attorney Thoreau. There were several actors in this confrontation in that classroom. So before we talk about what the officer did, let's talk about what the first actor, the teacher, the second actor, the principal, and of course the student. What should they have done, each one of them, before the police officer was called? I'm very glad you asked that question because all our attention is focused on the deputy sheriff when it ought to be focused also on the school, on why a teacher thinks that a youth who does not put her cell phone away is uh, in need of discipline. Uh, obviously, the girl wanted to stay in class. I would think a teacher would be happy about that. But the fact that a teacher who couldn't immediately get compliance for a student felt that they need to escalate and get a school administrator in the classroom, and then the school administrator thought that this minor disciplinary matter required the intervention of a school resource officer is exactly the crux of the problem here. Across America, school resource officers are being put in positions where they're asked to deal with disciplinary matters. They're not trained. In fact, South Carolina trains uh, officers three and a half hours out of the 400 hours in the police academy on juvenile justice issues. So 3.5 hours out of 400 hours are there to prepare officers to go work with young people. Then they put these officers in schools and the officers use adult techniques to deal with adolescent behaviors and you see these tremendous conflagrations, this terrific harm, not just to that girl, but to the students who observed it. And you see a school system spinning around thinking all of this, which is caught on a cell phone video because a girl didn't put her cell phone back fast enough. And, and don't forget here, this girl was going to be charged or is being charged now with disturbing a school in assembly. So well, I would argue that we, We've got to start with the teacher and the school administrator and say, or maybe they were disturbing the school and assembly by escalating their response to her behavior. Okay, Attorney Thoreau, I must ask you, what should that student have done? I'm, I'm guessing the student should not have taken her cell phone out, uh, should have put it away immediately when asked. But I also know that uh, teachers can respond quite differently when there's an infraction. And perhaps this teacher didn't know how to work with adolescents, or neither did the administrator. But the first thing you don't do with a teenager is get into a power battle in front of the teenager's peers. Because we know with teenagers that they're going to uh, make self-image trump their self-interest rather than lose face. And it, frankly, I can even imagine from her point of view that as soon as she put the phone away, and wanted to stay in class and return to being prepared to learn, uh, there was no need to escalate the incident as they had. Okay, let me now turn to Dr. Edmund. What is your opinion about that question, sir? Which, with the question regarding what the student should have done? What the student should have done, what the teacher should have done, what the administrator should have done before the police officer was called. Well, the question about what the student should have done, should, should have done is actually, to me, not a question. Okay. And, and I, I make that argument simply because uh, whenever we have a blatant abuse being implemented or you know being seen or being witnessed um, the notion that we could sort of deconstruct it to find out what you could have done differently without focusing on the obscene violence that we saw is deeply problematic it's it's, it's analogous to uh, you know walking to a uh, you know a cancer rally and saying you know why aren't we focused on AIDS you know it, 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 it takes away from the severity of the of the issue it takes away from the humanity of the victim um, and, and I think that when we're talking about this particular issue, it should be a hyper focus upon the schools, um, about the officer, and about the structure in place to allow that kind of abuse to be normalized. Do you think there is... ...number of police officers in schools as a result of a blatant act that was done involving, uh, you know, bringing a weapon into school and, and, and the unfortunate loss of life.
Um, at the same time, uh, with this severity and the increase of police presence in schools has been a decrease in the presence of mental health counselors, um, viable alternatives for kids to be able to release their stress and frustrations, uh, the closing of arts programs, the closing of opportunities for young people. But, but you're not suggesting that more police officers have, in fact, taken the resources from those things, are you? I would make the argument that the resources that are spent on police officers could very well be spent on those things as well. And if we see an increase of police and a decrease of a focus on the arts, for example, or counseling, for example, it, it, it forces us to question what kind of decisions are we making about teaching and learning. Stand by, please. I, I'd like to... The, uh, be before we go to that, uh, Attorney Thoreau, let us take another look here at another issue. The assault at Spring Valley High School in South Carolina reignited national concerns about rules on school disciplines. Critics saying the policies that criminalize minor misbehavior send kids, especially African-American kids, from the schoolhouse to the jailhouse. Our Sarah Hoy reports on an incident that started off as a prank and escalated quickly. I got arrested and booked and handcuffed. They cuffed me and another student up, and then we go down to the detention center. When I got in the office, they said they were going to arrest me. We sat down with one Enlo parent and two juniors at the high school to learn what happened and how it turned into such mayhem. Uh, I actually was there to uh, pick up my twin daughters, so I'm in the uh, carpool lane. I just saw a lot of police presence there and didn't understand why at the point at that time. I went inside and, and was going to check my daughters out. Um, that's when they told me that it was a, um, I guess it was a senior day prank, you know, water balloons or what have you. That's right. A massive water balloon fight is what had triggered the 911 call. The Raleigh Police Department dispatched 24 officers over the next few hours to restore order. A police officer runs up behind me, a really big guy. He grabs me. I snatch away from him, and he turns me around and grabs me by my neck and slams me on my back. I actually, uh, actually saw Jabriel getting picked up, slammed to the ground, and handcuffed by a uh, Raleigh police officer. Very, very disturbing. Very, very disturbing. It was very, very graphic. The first thing that went in my head was, I can't believe I'm about to get arrested. I got to walk my sister home because we ride the same bus. Jabriel Morris was not ultimately arrested, but Robert Brown was, and charged with disorderly conduct, a misdemeanor. An administrator grabs me from behind, grabs my arm, my, my shoulder, and he's like, uh, I seen you throw the water balloon, and I'm like, no, I didn't. So they take me to a conference room, they tell me you're about to be arrested. Eight Enlo students were arrested that day, along with parent Kevin Hines. <laughs> Hines says after witnessing what happened to Jabriel, he entered the school to alert the principal. He radios in to two other officers and they come swarm on me and slam me against the wall. And he, and he says, tase him, tase him. And at that point, I said, for what? Oh, for trespassing. I said, well, I have, you know, I have daughters here. So my daughter Hines was charged with trespassing. People might say, listen, cops had no idea what they were walking into. They got some calls. Things sounded hectic. The senior prank is always supposed to be fun, never hurting anybody, you know. I didn't see really anyone getting hurt by a water balloon, you know, no serious injury by a water balloon, you know, just a little water. Just a little water, but for these families, a life-altering impact. So I just want people to know that we aren't bad kids, we're not criminals, you know, we're not thieves, murderers, anything like that, we're just students that go to school. Let's go to Attorney Thoreau. Now, we just heard this incredible story, kids being kids, water balloon fight, escalating into penalties, I mean being arrested and a parent being arrested for trying to go in and see about his child. Now you train police how to interact with teenagers. How do you deal with this cultural racial deal? How do you explain to police officers that the first reaction shouldn't be to treat a student or the parent as the enemy? Well, um <laughs> We, we try, um, and, and it, I would like to put this in a little bit of a historical context because it was actually 1993 and 1994, way before Columbine, that Congress allocated federal funds to send, to send school resource officers into the public schools as part of a national move to criminalizing very normative, youthful behavior that was really instigated by the Central Park incident and that launched uh, a thousand legislative ships towards treating children as felons for very normative behavior, as I said. 
But what's disturbing here and really needs to, to be said is the, dis, uh, the distribution of school resource officers is disproportionately in schools where there are poor children and where there are children of color. And we don't see as many school resource officers in middle class um, and upper class white schools as we do in poor schools. And it, there's a great article showing that empirically by Aaron Krupchik and Jeff Ward. Um, so what you see here is a conflation of, um, of race and um, adult tactics being used with youth who are behaving normally, but uh, what we have to do with police when we train them, and we do this with patrol officers and school resource officers, and say, hold on a second here. What is your goal? And luckily, the International Association of Chiefs of Police has just come out in the last year saying the goal of SROs is to make sure kids stay in school, that we don't send kids down the pipeline to prison, as is happening in way too many schools across America, either because of acts of violence towards individual student, and, and you talk about Raleigh, North Carolina, but we can talk about multiple acts in Kentucky uh, to children as young as eight, um, and instead understand that you have to treat young people differently, and so what we do is train them in our Policing the Teen Brain training that adolescent development means that kids perceive, process, and respond differently, Let and therefore adults have to respond differently to them. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I have to point out two things. The Central Park incident, the so-called, um, well, it wasn't so-called. I mean, a, a woman was, was assaulted. Yeah. But it turned out years later that the four young people who were accused, who had even pled guilty to it, were totally innocent. Right. And uh, to his well, credit, uh, uh, adult... the uh, Attorney General, um, not the Attorney General, the District Attorney Morgenthau cleared him of those charges and publicly apologized for it. That's something that usually doesn't happen. But, but Let's talk about something else before we run out of time here. The student involved in that school in South Carolina, her classmates, some of them, and the teacher were African American. The administrator, I don't know, but they were all saying that they want the police officer back. How do you explain that? So, so you know, I, I think that's well, I probably the most fascinating piece of this whole conversation is the protests that have happened in favor of that officer. And many people view this as, well, that's happening because the kids think the officer was right or because they support the officer. And I view this as a more deep, deep-seated normalizing of violence. It's almost a contemporary equivalent of the Stockholm Syndrome, where people who are taken by captors actually over time start developing some empathy of the folks who captured them. So you have young people who have been in schools over such time that they've been, they, they've been abused for so long that they start viewing the oppressor or the person who's inflicting the violence as an ally rather than a person who's, the, who's, who's dangerously undermining the whole educational process. So when I saw the protests and the students favoring the officer, it reminded me of, of, of you know, of, of slaves who were traumatized. Who, just, who would say uh, things were better when we were back on the, on the plantation. It reminded me of a biblical story of when the children of Israel were being led away from Egypt who were angry at Moses for, for leading them towards, towards freedom. It's this idea of people being so afraid of what emancipatory practices are, so afraid of being able to live freely, so afraid of having a voice, so afraid of agency, that they would rather be normalized into a system of oppression like what we're seeing in today's public schools. And let's talk about gender here for a moment what? before we leave. Um, Attorney Thoreau. A young girl, teenage girl, being manhandled, as it were, by a, by a police officer. Well, it, you know, in other contexts, that'd be called domestic violence. It would certainly, if this happened to this woman, young woman on the street, there would be an easy case under Section 1983 for unreasonable and excessive use of force. And I think it's very disturbing to see a, a large male using his power that way over a very thin, tiny female. And if you look at the kids who protested, they were generally male. Um, so I totally agree that this is a normalizing of use of force, and it's a very very dangerous one if young men are looking at officers as models of behavior. Uh, we must also point out, and we can't talk about this now because we're out of time, that the young lady was orphaned and in foster care and obviously dealing with some terrific emotional issues and deficits just 
on the face, you know, with, with nothing else going on except that. That's enough. Yeah. She needed help. I, I think the, the really big thing for us to focus on is the larger emotional context here. And, you know, you know, Attorney Thoreau so brilliantly articulated the idea that, you know, if there's a domestic abuse situation, uh, the first thing we do is focus on the abuse. And, we, and the first response usually is get the person who's being abused out of that scenario as quickly as possible. When young people are being abused in schools, our response is return them back to that school as quickly as possible. In the world at large, we take you out of the abusive situation and help you to heal. In schools, we take you, we, we address, we uh, identify the abusive situation, and then we send you back there. Could you imagine the level of post-traumatic stress disorder that one has to undergo by being having to return back to a school every day that inflicted violence upon you? Could you imagine the damage that's done to the psyche of the young person in that video who had a red shirt on, who was peeking through his fingers because he couldn't witness the violence on this young person? So, so the, the depth of the complexities of what's happening here, we've only scratched the surface. The the results of what will really happen, we won't know until years down the line when these young people de develop this, 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 this bias against the school, bias against teaching and learning, bias against police officers, and it plays out in their lives for the rest of their lives. Christopher Edwin, Associate Professor at Columbia University and Attorney Lisa Thoreau, former Managing Director of the Juvenile Justice Center at Suffolk Law, thank both of you for joining us on Al Jazeera America.